All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to study session. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, Marlene Feist and Luis Garcia about some utility delinquencies and the parking systems. And we're not going to be hearing pitch for ARPA money because we don't do that at this, but we're going to hear their situation. And then we're going to hear about the comp plan amendments for this year. So Marlene and Luis, who wants to go first? Um, I don't think you need to. If we if we do need to, I can take care of it in a minute. Okay. All right. So, um, Council President, I apologize. I didn't have the. I couldn't talk about ARPA money. So there there is some slides in here that, that okay. do that. But um, it's just a long-standing thing. Is we're not having people lobby us for ARPA money. Otherwise, then we have to let everybody ARPA lobby us for ARPA money. But okay. Well, we but can go big do. Those. You can. You don't have to censor your slides. Yep. Go ahead. All right. So um, anyway, so here's where we're at as of October 1. Our uh, number of delinquent accounts is 8,500. Our outstanding balance today is 8.7 million. That includes all amounts uh, 30 plus days past the bill due date. Um, so here's how that breaks down. The bulk of it is residential. Um, nearly $6.7 million are residential customers and another 700,000 to multifamily. So the vast majority of it is to our residents. Um, this is kind of how those uh, balances break down. Um, so uh, a number of people have a relatively small balance. The average balance for that those 2,400 customers is about $110. Um, there's an, another large group that has a sort of this moderate balance, and their average balance is um, 712. We classified moderate as 200 to 2,000 dollars, and then the rest owe us. Um, much more than that. They pretty much missed every payment since um, the pandemic began. So that's this is the, the residential portion. Um, it doesn't include duplex, triplex, PUD, so that's why you see some of those numbers are a little bit different than the number on the first slide, yes. If, um, if they've missed every payment, I mean, is there a point where we turn off those utilities then? Uh, well, certainly there is, and that's what we're going to talk about, okay. right? So um, on, on total, we, that's the residential, single-family residential. Um, portion six point two million dollars. Half of these appear to be owner occupied, and the other half, approximately, are tenant occupied. So this is both. Um, so this is the support that we've helped to provide to the community by helping to direct people to um, funding resources that were available, um, and helping them sign up for repayment plans. So uh, through the the LIWAP money was um, the uh, the water wastewater equivalent of Lee Heap, so project share on the electric uh, gas side. Um, so that was uh, money that Congress allocated for the first time during the pandemic. Uh, SNAP uh, distributed that money, and our city customers got about $623,000 through that. Um, through rental assistance, um, customers also received another 350000 And then our U-Help program throughout the term of the pandemic has also distributed nearly another $350,000. So we have supported our customers to the tune of $1.3 million through those funds. We also have a, an outstanding request to the Department of Commerce. You'll probably recall that um, the legislature... Uh, allocated $100 million to help um, with utility bill delinquencies across the state, and that's for all kinds of utilities, so for power, mm -hmm. as well as water, wastewater, garbage. And that was really, um, the LIWAP and the Commerce dollars were really the only dollars that were available to our kinds of utilities. Um, uh, most of the support that happened earlier in the pandemic for utility bills were for heat bills, basically, for power bills for, for citizens. So ours were a little more challenging. Also, garbage was never really um, addressed except for with the commerce request and with our you help and the rental assistance dollars. The LIWAP was just for the water wastewater portion of the bills. <coughs> Currently, we have 442 active 
uh, repayment plans with customers. Those are no interest payment plans. We've been encouraging citizens to um, enter into those plans with us. Um, the balance on those plans is about $470,000. Over the course of the last couple of years, about 1,200 customers have signed up for these plans. These are the ones that are currently active. Some of them were completed, and a, a number of them were abandoned, um, and not uh, the customer didn't continue with those. But we have continued to promote those and to address that with customers to try to get them current on their bills. Marley, Marley. I have a question. I'm sorry. You mentioned that the difference between um, the backlog of tenant versus homeowners. So typically does a tenant pay their own utility or does the landlord pay the utility? Um, it depends in our, in our community. Um, the landlord is, the property owner is ultimately responsible for the bill. Um, some uh, property owners, landlords transfer that responsibility for payment onto their tenant. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the, the property owner is ultimately responsible for the bills that are incurred on their property. So if following through with that, if that delinquency would follow the property owner, not the tenant, right? So right. the tenant moves out, but then the property owner is responsible for payment, right? Correct. Correct. So if you turn off the water, then the, the land, the property owner is the, that's the person or entity that's actually getting punished for lack of payment. Right, right. Except for you know, landlord may ultimately evict a tenant for non-payment of this and other other responsibilities of the tenant. Also, water shut off, um, you know, risks the integrity of the housing stock going right. forward. There's so many there's so many um, properties that are in this situation that it's really untenable to turn off water to that many. But isn't it ultimately the landowner, the, the property owner, that that is responsible for the bill? That's what I have. It, yes. Say, right. Yes. So, and they're responsible for collecting from the tenant if the tenant's not paying it to us. The, and just yeah. as they would for any other bill that they're, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know how the, the Avista works a little different uh, in some cases. But I mean for ours. For I mean, ours, yes. It's their responsibility to get it from the tenant and either give either it to the, us. Yes, if the tenant's not paying it themselves, yeah. the, the property owner should be following up with the tenant yeah. as well. Yeah. So I know there was there was one, and I think I forwarded it to you, where there was a landlord who had a, a tenant that didn't pay. I think they evicted them, or they they ultimately left, but then they were still stuck with a pretty hefty right. utility bill mm -hmm. that, in their mind, was the responsibility of the tenant. But obviously, it does follow the property owner. So yeah, I mean, by contract, I mean their contract is between them and their their tenant. Yeah. But um, but we don't hold the tenant. We're not going to do collection action on a tenant who's left. with It's too transitory in nature. Over a few years ago, we went through this transition. The council president probably and council members, Kinnear and Stratton, will remember when we went through this transition because previously we had been sending bills to occupant. Yeah. Um, you know, it's now it's been a number of years because it was just associated with the property. And, and so the residents have in, into these repayment plans. Is That is in-house your Those are in-house repayment plans. You are reaching out with a designated person making yes. these yes. initial contacts yeah. to work through it. And they yeah. can they can actually apply online really simply. It's a really simple application. So normally what we would do if people, if we talk to them about that, when then we um, send them the link for the application and then we go ahead and approve those and get them set up for those. And when we were, when you were uh, mentioning the slide, you didn't mention or you didn't um, have duplexes, triplexes, multifamily in there. Is that coming later? Um, um, well, it, it's in the larger number, okay. council president, or council, uh, council <laughs> member, sorry. So the larger number there is the 6.6 million for 6.7 million for, for residential. That includes the du uh, duplexes and triplexes. And then you can see the multifamily okay. amount. So it, it was just... Um, just the way the data was okay. for us able to aggregate this is just single family residential. It gets a little more challenging when you throw in um, because it's not necessarily apples to apples when you have two units or three units. Their dollar amounts are not as cons consistent. Yeah. yeah. And for my own clarification, I'm just assuming that when we're talking about the um, water bill following the property owner, we're talking about on apartments as well. That ultimately rests on the owner of that apartment complex, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if there's more slides that come, so maybe I'm premature, but I'm just, in terms of next steps, I mean, have we thought about, you know, trying to, to settle some of these at a reduced amount? You know, 20% 20, 20 of it obviously is, is utility tax. We could obviously talk about impacts, you know, by waiving that. 
um, as a way to reduce some of the costs um, or to just incentives to get more people on those repayment plans. You know, if you get on by a certain date, you know, we'll reduce it X percent. You know, are we talking about any ideas like that? I mean, yeah. I mean, I think all those ideas are on the table. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is see if there's a way to reduce the number of customers initially, because 8,000 is a lot to deal with from an administrative perspective to get them all onto a specialized plan. So what we're trying to do is, is see if there's a way to get funding through the commerce funding and through other potential funding sources to reduce that initial load so that we can actually manage um, what's in front of us in a more responsible way. I, I do think there's some ability to compromise some of the debt and there's some precedent there. Typically we can't write off utility debt until it's six years old. No. But um, in these cases, we're not talking about huge dollar amounts for most of these customers. So we can weigh the cost of um, collections activities versus um, you know, the ability to write off. If we do higher than $599 in a write off, however, we do have to enter into um, sending tax documents, so 1099s to a customer that received a credit mm. through, um, through, through write off. So that was one of the things we had explored with the council president was limiting it to 599 and seeing what we could do that way. So one, one more question on that. So do we by chance have the data that would show us um, which of these households maybe received rental assistance through throughout the last two years that are still owing utilities, and then which uh, received dollars through rental assistance to pay for their utilities, and so those are already paid for and covered. Right. So um, when we have this data, we we could break that down by customer because we know which customers have received. Uh, this is aggregated, but but we do know which customers have received all of these supports because they they actually go on as credits on their bill. So we can sort the data by those particular customers as well. And in fact, we did some of that because for the commerce dollars, um, one of the requirements was they had to have received some sort of um, support in the past. And so we, we used our UHelp database. We used anybody who came through um, rental assistance. And then we actually also cross-referenced with Avistas um, our customers who had received project share money or other COVID relief from Avista, and we used that data to um, actually add folks to that pool that we could then send to um, Commerce for a request. Okay. Um, on the Commerce, um, and you might have said this, and I just missed it, but so 1.1 million. Is there? What's the limitation on that? Is that are we still gathering? customers we would send to them or is the money gone like what's the ability of that to go higher so we were limited um, with this, a certain period of time and um, the customers that we were allowed to send forward to commerce had to have received some sort of support so that's what we were able to come together with avista data and our data and it's about $1.1 million. And whether they choose to go above that really depends on the requests they received statewide. Um, we actually did the initial information to Commerce in May. We sent additional information at their request in both June and July. And Commerce has not announced how they're going to split up that $100 million. So right now we're in, we're in a holding pattern waiting to hear back from Commerce. So um, we we continually we send a, an email to our contact at Commerce every couple of weeks to ask the status, and so far um, they're telling us it's still pending. Councilmember Stratton. So my head is spinning a little bit. Let me see if I can make sense of this. So on the side of the rentals, um, the outstanding bills from rentals, those ultimately are the responsibility of the, of the landowner or the homeowner, or the building owner, right? Mm -hmm. And they got, so how would you figure out those that got rental assistance? Because all of that money, that what I understood was that money all went to landlords. That went to... They, the could, they could use rental assistance for utility payments, and right. then it came as a credit to that account at the city. So um, the, the managers of the rental assistance would say, you know, customers A, B, and C received $100, $200, $300 toward their, their, um, toward their um, bills, outstanding bills. We applied that credit. So that's how we can do that. So we, yeah. 
when you do that, then you look at the, the landowner, not the tenant, because the tenant didn't get that rental assistance. Well, in many cases, it was a tenant that got the rental assistance. It was based on the tenant's um, application. But those, as you know, were supported by the property owners right. and landlords. Right. And so those were then um, allowed to be credited to those accounts. Right. I just, that's interesting to see how, how you have to break those down. To yeah, see. yeah. And, you, you know, when we say about half are, are owner occupied and half are tenant occupied, that's our best estimate, right? Because no one has to tell us that they're renting their facility. We can usually tell if there's, you know, a duplicate bill goes to um, a tenant or something like that. And that's how we kind of make those, those determinations. But, but it isn't a requirement for someone to tell us that they're renting it and paying the bill. Because in some cases, they just collect that from the tenant, but then the property owner pays that right. bill on a monthly basis. They include so much for water, wastewater, and garbage utilities. And I just worry about those tenants that received assistance. You know, they filled out the paperwork and their rent was sent to their landlords, right? And them thinking that it was their their problem that they didn't pay the bill, pay the um, they couldn't pay the rent, so they applied. They got the they didn't get the funding. The landlord got the funding for it. But I think if they got if they got funding, because not every person who got rental assistance got funding for utilities. If, if they reached their max with rental, it went to rent first. And then if there was a, the ability to go to utilities. And then those went as a direct to the credit. It didn't go to the landlord to pay us. It went on as, as a credit onto their to utility the account, utility to the, okay. to the so utility account. No, it isn't, it isn't that we gave it to someone and then it wasn't paid okay. to us. Well, and, and my reason for asking the question on that was really just to see if we could easily identify what I think would be the, 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 the likely group of folks that would probably be most in need. And I think if you know that they had access rental assistance, they're probably the top of that list in terms of needing utility, further right. utility and so assistance. What we haven't done, uh, to your point, is cross-reference all the people who got rental assistance. We only know the people who got rental assistance applied to their utility bill. So I don't have the full, I haven't cross-referenced the full universe of city residents who received rental assistance to their utility account, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, Lots of questions for us, so thank you for being so good at answering them. But when you say half tenant occupied, half owner occupied, is that in terms of number of accounts or the amount of money owed? That's in terms of numbers, numbers of accounts. Do you have a sense of the amount of money owed? In I don't. Those I don't think we do because it, it's not a it's not a pure science on that one. There isn't a there isn't a, a data field to be able to. So this is a sampling. You know, I have uh, James Caddy, who's an amazing uh, data guru um, who's able to tell me it's about and it, it's his best estimate but I don't know that there's a way for me to tick through and say this is owner occupied this is rental occupied except for on the ones I mean we could try looking at um, looking at the full database if we're allowed to access that we'd have to check with the with those agencies that have that data it'd be again just from a high level it'd be mm -hmm. helpful to know because there's a very I think there's a big difference between numbers of accounts versus amount owed so that's, but I, I get the answer. Secondly, uh, we supply water to a lot of people outside the city. So yes. in terms of these delinquent accounts, are we only talking delinquent accounts inside or are we talking delinquent this accounts? This is our outside? full customer base. And okay. I could get that data. I don't have it with Because that would be today. another yeah. pretty critical thing if we're going to okay. spend um, some fund of money on something is whether they're inside the city, outside the city. Um, so that would, and again, not so much the number of accounts to me, but the amount of money. The value, yeah. We, we could break um, that down. Absolutely, Council President. I did not ask that for that data okay. today, so I okay. apologize. Did we have any utilities that were paid for with, like, the, the rental assistance coming from, say, the county because the, the residents lived in um, unincorporated or, or just out, outside the city but served by the city? It's possible, but I don't, I don't have that. I can ask that question. Okay. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm jumping ahead, yeah. Marlene. So this is where we're at. So will we be asked when do we start shutting off water? Is that is that where we're right. going so this, down that path? So this is kind to? of, let's, let's talk about that next, okay. okay? So, you know, what I really want to do, I mean, whether it's ARP or other dollars, we want to reduce the number of households facing housing insecurity due to accumulated bills. I want to reduce the number of households sent to collections for past due. I want to reduce the number of households facing water utility shutoff. 
I mean, these, these, are, these are negative health impacts for people. This is stress and um, more added burden on, you know, already strained families in our community. So um, here's how, it, it, you know, really the bottom line is, I think this is going to be easier for you to see. So if we were able to get $4 million in relief, I could, I could um, actually, you know, pay each person, provide a credit of up to $1,000 and reduce the number of customers who um, had passed due bills by, you know, 75%. That's assuming we get the commerce dollars. So, I mean, this is what we're talking about. If, if, if there's a way for us to reduce, which would get us all at our lower balance customers, lower balance owed customers, and still have um, some you know, customers with larger balances that we could then work through those in a, in a much more efficient way. A couple thousand customers is one thing. Um, 8,000 is another in terms of how, we, how quickly we can get them back into current status and getting to the point where they can manage their monthly bills. So these are the kinds of things that we've been looking at is what can we do to, to ease the burden and make it better. Even, even small amounts can actually reduce um, the overall number of accounts that we have to manage because there's that bulk of there's that larger number of customers that owe you know a smaller amount of money. So I asked quite a while ago for the breakdown if we did 1198, which would be half yes. a write off, half um, an ARPA, and it keeps us we don't have to send out the yes. 1099s. Do you have that slide? Um, that one when we got new numbers for October. Um, that kind of got lost. Okay, because I <laughs> really want to see that. And, and, that's and that was the... sent to you in your email. It did? Okay. Mm -hmm, about I three or four weeks ago. I'll resend okay. that to you. But it was... Okay. It All was right, well, the, thank you. I didn't the, see it. It but. was in the $3 million range um, that if we did half a five ninety nine in ARPA per customer and a five ninety nine in write-off, um, $3 million if we applied the ARPA first is what we would need. And then we could get, we would be close to that 1500 It would be a little bit less than that. Um, so between 1000 and 1500 we would probably reduce the number of accounts by 80% or so that would owe us money, Council President. Okay. Um, but I, that bar got lost, I'm seeing. Okay. So, but yes, and, and what we were at was about a $3 million ARPA spend if we applied that first, which would be the easiest way so, to manage the numbers. Three million ARPA, three million write-off. Yes. So it'd be six million. Yes. Plus the commerce. Yes. And that would get us pretty close. It would get us close, right? Okay. So we'd work because this is this assumes the commerce is already off the top because that's how we okay. have to do it. Um, so because it's easiest to take commerce away and then do the remaining accounts. Um, so that's where we're at. And so we're, we're hoping commerce just tells us we get the award. I mean, because mm -hmm. I could apply it to the accounts and then backfill it with the money that came. Um, so. So that's where we're at there. But I did send that a few weeks ago. I'll resend and it I'm to the. I apologize that for a variety of reasons, I'm behind on my email. No, no, thank I, you for I sending it. completely appreciate that. So I'll resend to the whole group um, after this, and you can take a look at that scenario. Okay. It's a it's a month behind, but it's pretty darn close. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question real oh, yes, quick. Go ahead. So, what what would happen if we don't, you know, write off if we don't use ARPA dollars because, um, you know, there's a lot of people who are hurting and need help. That's for sure. Um, you know, in, in my district, obviously, there's a lot of people. I also have a lot of people in my district who, despite the pain, you know, continue to pay their bills. And I think for them, if we say, hey, it would have been better for you to not pay your bills because then the city would have stepped in, I think that's a, yeah. that's a tough incentive to be, uh, you know, giving out to folks. And so, um, I mean, a lot of people in, in my district right now that, that have paid their bills with gas and groceries and everything going up could use $1,200 right now. And so... I'm just curious, you know, where we're at on that. Oh, can I respond? Yeah, totally. I don't want to debate this. Yeah. But, but I just want to say that we don't know people's individual situations. Mm -hmm. So for the people that paid their bills and were able to, they probably made horrendous sacrifices to do so. The people who didn't might have been just that one step below them and could not pay their bills. So we don't know those situations. I lived, lived across the street for, for 17 years, a woman who could not pay her bills. And it was devastating. The water was turned off because she couldn't pay. So she was living in a house with no water. She owned the house, eventually lost the house. But watching that spiral downward and not able to do anything to help her 
was devastating. I don't want to see that happen to anybody else. Yeah, and I'm certainly not advocating that we abandon folks. What I'm saying is that there's a there's a real segment of people who, when we do this, are going to say, "What? Why should I pay my bills?" And that's that's Everybody's the only question that I think is. is different. I understand, and you know, know, you gave a very charitable view of you know a situation, but there are other situations in there that aren't as charitable. So, okay. I saw Councilmember Wilkerson first, and then Councilmember Cathcart. Thank you. So I. We certainly don't want to re-traumatize people mm -hmm. who are already in a desperate situation. But I have to ask, if we sent out notices to disconnect, there are some who cannot and will not be able to pay. But there are others who may be in that space where because we haven't pushed a little bit, they have not responded. Mm -hmm. So I would <clears throat> be in favor of seeing what type of response we get back um, because we haven't done that yet. So, and I only say that because with all the help and all the need, we know there are some people who have taken advantage of the situation since COVID happened. It's happened in rental assistance, it's happened in utilities, it's happened with businesses as well. So how do we kind of move the envelope to really kind of tease out who really needs the help and then there are ones who really could step up a little bit and start making either a payment plan or something else, whether that be the renter or the owner of the property themselves. So that would be uh, something I'd like to talk a little bit more about. So my challenge with that, council member, is that I cannot shut off 8,000 customers for water in any reasonable time frame. So how do I decide that I'm gonna turn off Councilmember Bingle's water and not yours, because that's really the decision I'm at. Because I cannot physically Do turn Bingles off. That's an easy yeah. call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so this is it, it's um, it's logistically not possible for me to shut off 8,000 customers for water. So then it becomes also another hollow threat. So uh, if we do want to go just strictly the collections route, I'm going to come with a, a, a resolution to council to ask me to suspend the water shutoff and go through. We have collection agencies, and I would run them through collections because I don't think I can manage the shutoff. Councilmember Cathcart, could we, uh, as an alternative, um, could could we instead uh, basically do this as a lien? I mean, basically say, look, you've got six months to come up with a payment plan. You know, make an agreement with us on a payment plan, or we're simply going to basically wipe the slate clean, so to speak. But basically, what's owed will be added as a lien on the property and when it's sold, we would get paid back at that point in time. Yeah, we, we can't lean based on water bills. That's why you have water shut off because you can't do the lien on water. Um, I would have to talk to legal about the others and whether that made sense. I mean, we can do a lien, for example, on, on uh, garbage abatements. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some possibility to do that, but it's a lot of paperwork for thousands yeah. of customers to yeah. do that, that level of lien. Mm. I wanna amend my request for your update yeah. uh, and I really appreciate you doing that. But for, for inside the city and outside the city. I think there's okay. going to be a, a real issue if we're spending ARPA money on people outside the city and the county can do it uh, potentially. And maybe we say, hey, we'll meet you halfway still. We'll match you on write-offs. But in terms of if we could get the 1198 yep, for inside the city. Absolutely. Uh, then What's 1198? 599. It's 599, 599. match yeah. of oh, okay. 599 ARPA, 599 write off. That way we don't have to do the 1099 and then yeah. we can. Got it. Okay. And then yeah. we're all good with the 121256. 12, 12, <laughs> yeah. oh, the, <laughs> all the math works out. All the math works. Yeah. So we, I definitely can get that information okay. and probably James can get it in the next day or so. Because okay. um, we've looked at a lot of that. It's just. I'm picking and choosing which um, data points to show you to be but to be fair. That's why we do study sessions. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know this is kind of. You know where we're at. Um, I, I'm hoping that we get some final answers on funding this month, if we can, so that we can make really more of a definitive plan. Because it's, you know, if I have, if I know there's credits to the account, it's one letter. If I know it's it's not, it's another letter. And I just need to be able to decide what it is, rather than sort of spinning everyone up on g going to collections when I have some ability to help them. Right? Uh, we go live with our uni utility billing system on November one. That's just a constraint that it just is. So I just want you to know that. So by year's end, we, the goal would be to send certified mail to, to notify the customers of where they stand with, with the ability to have some credits, with the ability to perhaps get some write-offs, or with, you know, here's where we're at. 
and then work with them to get current. So we're going to need um, some temp employees. I'm, I'm thinking a temp agency might be effective in this case to help us work through this. Um, and we probably will need a resolution to say that we were going to suspend water shutoff for this group of customers. But then once, if it's new debt, I don't want to lose that tool because so anything that would happen from that point forward would be considered new debt and then the, the normal process would proceed, which I'd really like to do that. We haven't charged late fees and things like that, so there aren't a lot of things I can easily waive. We, we've suspended late fees and haven't restarted them at, with, um, with, at this point because we're just trying to work through this resolution, and I know that that sounds, uh, at least this way, there, there isn't additional charges. These are truly their charges for services. It's not like they've been racking up late charges all this time as well. Hey, Marlene, do so. we know what Avista's doing with heat? With well, there, there, there was a lot of additional money up front for heat, and so they were able to kind of, they did rounds of COVID relief um, that they were getting from the federal government. Okay. So they're in a little bit different position, um, and then I'm sure they're still working through their backlog. I mean, I think every utility is working through the backlog, um, so I don't, I don't think we're unique that way, but I do think we, um, it's time to have that plan formulated. So if, if you can help me get to resolution on a couple of these questions, that would certainly be helpful. Um, you know, we're looking at large expenditures in the water system, uh, um, you, you know, along the US 195 corridor and other places. And if we have to say, look at a revenue bond, the, the, at least having the plan in place will help us if we have to have a discussion with those rating agencies too. There's so many facets to this. <clears throat> Our, our families need support. Our utility needs to be able to, you know, have a reliable funding source going forward. We need to be able to respond to water needs throughout the community, particularly around housing growth areas. So there's a lot of um, facets to this. All right. Thanks for all the time. I know we have to have, give Move Luis on. a little bit of time. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> do you have any other key slides that you need to give us? No. Okay, great. <laughs> Good. Awesome. The right Thank answer. Thank you. Thanks for walking the gauntlet. All right, Luis, hope you're well prepared now. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm well. Uh, so first. <laughs> <laughs> so, Council President, you're going to see some, a lot of similar slides that, uh, that you and I discussed in our, uh, in our meetings. So, um, you want to go ahead and advance? Go ahead. Oh, I can use it over yep. here? Oh. Yep, you can just pull that mouse closer if you want to. It should stretch a little bit more. Okay. All right, so, uh, so we're really here to talk about how the, uh, the parking fund has taken a, a hit and some direct uh, um, reasons for it. So um, COVID affected a lot of, lot of things and, and parking was no different. So we um, shut down our meters um, during COVID to accommodate a lot of the businesses. So lessen some of the burden on the customers that were coming downtown or, um, or were still working downtown. So uh, we shut down the meters and that's a, a direct revenue stream, the largest revenue stream that we have uh, for the Park and Services Department. We did that to support other uh, entities. How um, long was that for? Uh, well, you can start uh, on the next slide. I'll, uh, it'll, it'll show, or one of the other slides, it'll show kind of the time frame. Um, but I don't remember the exact month we turned them off. February? March. March 25th. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so we, when we shut them down, uh, you know, all of the other operations were still there because people should still be moving. We still wanted to make sure that, uh, that all of the safety was still uh, being enforced. So operations, we still kept having the expenses, just didn't have the revenue to support it. Um, so you can see uh, kind of the impacts coming down from, uh, from 2020. Again, we had a little bit lesser of a loss in 2021, and uh, it continues to, to be in a, in a positive trend, but not quick enough. Uh, we're we're going to see ourselves uh, coming up a little bit uh, in another slide into a budgetary shortfall that, uh, that we can't, can't really get past. So along with the, uh, the shutting down the meters, we also um, did some other things to help the businesses downtown. We put those 10 minute zones in front of the, the businesses for the, the pickup. It was well received, but those were all high use meter locations. So from a public policy standpoint, it made sense. But again, revenue is not uh, gonna be coming back for those because they're using them for uh, free parking in a 10 minute uh, time to say. 
So and then uh, the other uh, issues that uh, that kind of impacted it was uh, all the other um, changes to downtown. You know, the Central City Line took out parking meters, uh, bringing the the um, precinct downtown took out parking meters that were in very high use areas. So all of those um, obviously operational need was uh, was great, but uh, those meters don't uh, don't generate any revenue no more. Yes, are sir? you are you going to talk at all about any of the ex the expense side? Yeah. Okay. Great. So from our uh, our fund, um, talking about the uh, the uh, the sources, you know, it's about 4.4, 4.5 million, but uh, but the uh, the use uh, that that has been going on again has been greater than uh, sh than our uh, than our funding sources showing about a five hundred twelve thousand dollar shortfall this year. So a couple of those uh, have been again the removing the uh, the meters from service. So along with everything that's been going on, we've been trying to uh, upgrade our meters, and that's not uh, as fast. It's not like just slapping your fingers and the new devices are in place. So there's downtimes when we're trying to remove old technology and install new technology, um, and that's uh, also contributing to some of our operation shortfalls and uh, LPR technology with everything that's been happening uh, you know in the world trying to get the new technology down here delivered has been delayed after delay after delay so um, we have received our technology just recently and got them installed in our vehicles but uh, without it it's uh, it's hard to have an efficient enforcement pro program sir what does LPR mean uh, license plate reader Thank you. So that's a, instead of having a parking uh, specialist walking a beat, they're in a vehicle and the, the reader is trying to say that vehicle has been here uh, or they mark it, uh, it, it marks it at that location, come back around uh, past that time stay, the vehicle is still in that spot, it'll, it'll signal to them saying, wait a minute, they, uh, they, they needed to uh, switch block bases. So for example, uh a spot is a two-hour parking spot that is there for two and a half hours, then we know that they've been there longer than they can. Correct, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You can see that. That's good. All right, so, uh, so here's that, that, uh, the, um, the breakdown of, uh, of our um, so funding sources and expenses. So if you can look down, you know, then 22 all the way down, you can see that $512,000 loss. Um, you know, I, I did want to expand it out to show that uh, this is not just a current need, it's also a future need as well, because looking at 2025, we also have the uh, parking structure uh, balloon payment. And that is uh, pretty scary. I mean, if, if nothing else changes, we're looking at about a $7 million uh, operating loss within the parking fund. But that's not from parking. That's from the lawsuit that the city had to settle for bond right, fraud, pay it, essentially. Right. Um, and is that, at the end of 2025, is that done then? Or do we still, the payments go on uh, beyond that? I, I believe that was supposed to terminate after that balloon payment, right? It's paid off unless we refinance it and extend it out. Right. That will not be done. Right. And we're paying right now about how much per year to pay off that lawsuit? Oh, man. It's, uh, where was that at? Yeah, so that that 1.9 is it's okay. is pretty pretty much what uh, what we're paying for that debt. I mean, and we can't. I can hear you, but the other people. I'm wondering oh, if you could come yeah. down and talk about that debt because I think people don't understand that the parking system would not be having a problem, but for the fact that we're paying off a lawsuit that has nothing to do with our parking system. And I'm just wondering how much per year are we paying for that? So as you see in 21... And I can't read those numbers, so go ahead and tell me. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah. So our annual debt payment is about $2 million. Okay. So it is growing each year because, you know, remember, we took three um, SIP loans for the capital investment in our new system. Right. Right. And so it's growing a little bit, but for the parking garage, it's about $2 million a year. Okay, so that's a baseline yep. that people long before us decided to take out of your parking system, uh -huh. and we've been paying that lawsuit off with parking revenues. Um, but then in 2025, we owe the balloon back unless we refinance. Correct. Okay. Can we, can we describe that a little bit? Because you said balloon at the end. So we have a balloon payment in 2025? That's correct. Yeah. Do we, what's the total of that balloon payment? Uh, the total debt service in 25 is almost $5.8 million. I think about can you... five million of it is for the garage. Okay. So the other piece of this is 
with, there was a, we have a, a PAC, a parking advisory committee. Downtown Spokane Partnership was getting a percentage of parking revenues when, when it was over a certain amount. So they haven't been getting that, right? That, that, that's correct. And usually they were used to fund different projects throughout the city. And that, that hasn't happened. Recently. And that hasn't there happened. Hasn't and it doesn't money. look like it will happen for some time. Yeah, we were funding about 250000 a year. Yeah. Um, I think they are just now paying off one of their projects. Um, but, yeah, we re stopped funding other projects probably two years ago because of COVID. Correct. We just couldn't do it. So if there was somehow a loan to the parking system, so I'm kind of talking about this as I'm thinking about as I'm talking about, but if we loaned the parking system money to meet their obligations, could we then extend the rate of not payment to DSP to pay that back? Does that make sense? So once we're solvent, even though we'd have money, we would use that money to pay back our pay, pay ourselves back. Yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't know if it was a... a, a can, can you code. get a little closer to the mic? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure if it was like a municipal code obligation. It, that it was municipal satisfy. code, but, but we might be able to yeah. do something differently. I'm just trying to be, yeah, think no, creatively. Just, absolutely. You know, I'll have to check into that. Okay. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, maybe follow that similar thread. Um, like if we essentially loaned... The, the parking services a loan from ARPA paid off, essentially paid off the loan, and then just had an agreement that essentially the debt service would essentially go to the general fund for the next three years. Um, I feel like you could kind of make the whole thing whole in that situation, but I don't know if you can obligate a future council like that either, so mm -hmm. I don't know. They do it all the time, and that means then that you wouldn't pay, yeah, DSP out. wouldn't receive money. That money that they would normally receive would go to pay that debt off. Right. With that, for whatever number of years, that'd be like two or three years, whatever. Um, can you, uh, has anyone been exploring the refinancing of the lawsuit debt? Has anyone, what's, what's the story on that? I think at this point, the plan is possibly to take out a SIP loan in 25 to repay that and, okay. and put it out over another five years. Okay. Um, and then... I've questioned you on this, Luis, and this happened before your time, but uh, the department did, and I'm not sure what year, someone could remind me, you came to us and said, under the new parking plan, we absolutely need to charge meter rate stays based on how much demand there is. Um, and we gave the department the ability to uh, do that, and they've had that ability now for several years. Uh, there was a flee from flight from downtown during the 2020 for a few months it sounds like but my own experience I'm sure everyone else's experience uh, is that there are no parking spaces easily found on the street especially after the 10 minute spots and the other ones are removed so the demand for parking that people would be willing to pay is much higher and there my understanding is despite requesting that authority to do that and to make your decisions based on the market demand that has not been happening, and I'm just wondering what the status of using that, because to say that we don't have the money when there's plenty of demand, and you, not you literally, but your department sold us on that idea that that's really the way, based on the parking study, we should be doing. It doesn't seem like we're doing that. Sure. So, so the plan moving forward, uh, again, without the LPR technology that was deployed, previous LPR was just really limited to uh, scoff law enforcement it didn't have the ability to to do the time stays like we like we wanted to to see that uh that um uh percentage of of open uh, um spaces or stalls so we have identified a, a few things that would again turn around uh, some of those budgets a little bit uh, quicker so we're trying to find the solutions obviously i I per didn't want to bring up ARPA, so I'm glad that you guys did. But um, these are something that we're trying to uh, to help out that uh, the fund as well. Um, so one of the things that uh, that we but learned before you do that, just to be clear, I think you said you have the LPR. So could you do those studies starting next month? Yeah, uh, that is uh, that is the plan, uh, Council okay. President. So we okay. have them in. We have them uh, installed. Uh, we're working on the uh, the programming on the back end. So we'd start ha deploying those within our downtown core and have some real data uh, in, um, that's going to be coming into us, something that we've severely lacked for so many years. 
Sir. And with the new meters that are going in that have a lot more digital capability, is that something where you would be able to adjust parking rates as opposed to, you know, it's it's a programming for quarters and things like that. Is that something that you'll be able to do? Yes, sir. We'd be able to push out uh, those type of price changes instead of physically having to handle the meter, which is something that uh, the, the 2G meters demanded of us. So it was hard to, to raise any rates uh, with that, with the old technology. So one of the things that we did learn with uh, when we were setting up our new equipment and the new vendors is that um, the parking fund was absorbing all of the convenience fees of all, all the transactions. Um, and that, uh, that was you know, to the tune of, uh, you know, what, $180,000 a year. And that, that, again, other rate payers that may be paying with a different uh, um, payment method were subsidizing that cost. So that was something, and it was pretty unique to, uh, to parking. Other um, uh, entities, parks on their park lots, a, a, a lot of different uh, entities, uh, um, tax and licensing, all of them uh, pass those transaction fees on to the person that is getting the convenience of using that payment method, something that we haven't done in the past. So I just want to say, Council President, I got a parking ticket in the mail <clears throat> the end of last week, and it was $52. So somewhere, something's gone up. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's not the rate. That's the penalty. Right. right. Yeah. But right. Yeah. That, that's two dollars. So the the so pe penalties have gone up. Yeah. Uh, but based on the whatever infraction it was. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the uh, the identified um, strategies as to uh, again no longer absorb those uh, those transaction fees, with the uh, the setup and the contracts that we have in place. Uh, it would be a thirty five cent um, increase to the uh, to the um, rate payer. But it would uh, it would be big for us uh, because it would actually ge generate a revenue of seventy two thousand annually. So that would be a swing of about two hundred fifty two thousand a year for the parking fund. And it's again just for the convenience of using that specific payment method. They have other options to to, to pay for the meter. Um, the other one was again talking about that meter increase uh, that council president that you mentioned. So um, that statute did talk about the uh, the occupancy rates, but it also talked about again market um, and, and and what that was looking like, giving us really the uh, the factor in favor of raising rates. And one of those was uh, that we are similarly situated cities of our size. We are severely uh, um, low in, on what we charge for for parking. So speaking with uh, you know the City of Boise, they have theirs that are actually go up based on the time stay that you have. So where uh, a, a premium space, you know, our two-hour zones, um, they're charging, you know, two dollars an hour, and then that's for the first two hour, uh, the first hour. Then it's three dollars for the second hour. Four-hour zones, you know, it would be two dollars for the first hour, three dollars for the uh, third and fourth hour, and they don't have anything greater than that four-hour zone. Um, so those, uh, obviously, the, the escalating um, fees kind of dwarf what we're, we're doing over here with $1.20 an hour for our high-use um, meters. So by increasing that, the statute, uh, according to the statute, that $0.50, cents, um, it would generate uh, quite a bit. You know, it would be a $1.5 million increase in the, uh, the revenue for that. So that's a, that's a big Can thing. Can you walk through that? I, I can't quite see the very end of it, but on the current revenue... It says increase parking fees immediately and would go up by 2.6 million, or is that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and then, but somehow by the end it gets down to less than that. What, what's that? So currently we're bringing in about 2.6 million in revenue for 2022. Okay. And this would increase the budget or revenue uh, funding um, to 4.1, which is, it would okay. bring in okay. about so 1.5 million annually. It. So the increase isn't 2.6, it's? Correct, that's okay. current. Got it, okay, got it. Makes sense. All right. so we'll move on to again talking about the uh, sorry talking about the different uh, um, changes to uh, to the system. Um, this is a, a spreadsheet that's sh that's showing projections based on um, making those changes. Uh, those were two just two strategies that we uh, that we identified. Another one was uh, also going to be uh, trying to limit the amount of SIP loads that we take for the um, project enhancement. So right now we have, we're scheduled for three. Um, hopefully, if we uh, change the mix of kiosks and, uh, and meters, uh, then we can save not only on capital um, expenses, but also in uh, actually operating them annually. Yes. So have you checked with accounting to see, because we are only allowed to use SIP loans up to 15%. So have you checked with accounting to see where we are now in terms of what's our 
What's our percentage of usage now? I'm not sure what it is now, but I know the three SIP loans that we have currently have already been approved and are funded. So I think we need to learn what our percentage is now mm -hmm. and what other requests for SIP loans are out there so we don't go over our 15%. And I know that the council can change that amount, but I'm reluctant to do so. I'll pass that on to Michelle Murray. I know she handles those but, SIP loans. But you're saying the three SIP loans are already approved yeah. in right. that capacity. But, mm -hmm. but I'm, yeah. I'm saying let's make sure we know what that, yeah. Yeah. and that okay. raises up the percentage. So let's make sure we know what that is. Absolutely. And you might have to send this out to us, but so this has no ARPA funds, just the increased um, meter rates and the uh, transaction fees being absorbed by the person incurring them. And then that, I'm assuming, I can't, it, that it changes it from red to black going forward. Yeah, so in this uh, projection, it shows in 2025, we're only going to be uh, just under a million dollar shortfall instead of what we had before. With the? With the raised uh, 50 cents. But with the, there's not a shortfall, but for having to pay back the balloon that, payment. That balloon payment, yeah. Most so, of it would be covered within So what raise. would 2024 be as a more representative year? Uh, we would have a $1.4 million um, fund balance at that point. Okay. Councilmember Cathcart and then Wilker. I'm not Cathcart, Bingle and then Wilkerson. Council President, Councilman Cathcart, I love it. <laughs> uh, so when we, uh, when we, if we were to approve this change, uh, how quickly would that go into effect? How quickly could we actually get it implemented? Uh, uh, w which change? We're not, we're not proposing a change. They're, they're doing it. Yeah, they're, they're on an increase of fifty cents. I thought that. Yeah, was that's not that doesn't yeah. come to us oh. anymore. Yeah. Oh. no, oh. no. Under and the new thing, they have the authority to manage that, so it's not oh, okay. correct. It and, it, and it also has had. Uh, um, we presented it to uh, to administration, and they, they were in favor uh, or didn't object to it. Okay, so we haven't implemented this yet. Is that correct? correct? So when we decide to implement that, or when you decide to implement that, how quickly will that be able to be implemented in the field? Yeah, so uh, we will want to make sure that we're messaging it uh, appropriately so people that are used to parking in their same spot uh, that they do every day for work or whatnot don't get surprised for it. But, uh, but yeah, it shouldn't, be, uh, it shouldn't be a long one. Uh, I'm going to look to Justin to see if there was anything uh, else that I'd like to add on that. No? Yeah, two, yeah, a matter Couple of weeks. weeks. It's not a long, long uh, lead time, but it's just uh, the programming working with our vendors. Okay. And then if we do end up having an extra $1.4 million in that, um, uh, in that fund, is there any way that we would be able to save the amount necessary for that balloon payment to where we don't have to do any extra accounting? We can just be planning for 2025. So this projection shows 1.5 million each year from 23 through 25. And so it would just minimize that impact of that balloon payment. But we would start building up our um, cash balance. Right. To so that would roughly give us 3 million in the next couple mm -hmm. of years. And that balloon payment was? Yeah, we'd about, be about a million dollars short. About a million dollars short. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Wilkerson and Councilmember Kinnear. So I just, my standard question now is, are there any proposed cuts available in your department to help balance out these revenues as we go forward? Sure. Um, so I would say what we're doing right now, uh, and, and while it's uh, trying to be responsive to the budgetary shortfall, um, I, I don't believe it to be sustainable. So we have, uh, he I've held all open positions vacant. So I have some, uh, some salary savings there that I'm trying to, uh, to assume, uh, just trying to, uh, again, not hurt the, the, the balance any, any greater. So uh, as far as other cuts to it, um, you know, we really don't have anything uh, in excess of parking. Um, everything is, is uh, decided based on the efficiency, the best efficiency that we can. Councilmember Kinnear, and we're kind of over, so Sorry, time. I'll be but quick. Go ahead. Um, so this 50% raise in parking fees. 50 cent. I mean, sorry, <laughs> 50 cents. See, see where I'm headed? Yeah. Um, is that on a par with the private lots? Because we know private lots for years yeah. have been so much more expensive. So they, they uh, recently raised, a lot of them raised their, uh, their rates as well. So, so I would say there's still a big disparity between the two. Um, but it's not as, as great. Um, I mean, we haven't raised rates, and I want to say since 2011. Right. Um, so uh, we're, we'd be, there's too much ground to make up to make it comparable uh, okay. at this point. Is there a plan then to systematically and incrementally increase so that we're more on a par 
so people don't circle the lots five the blocks five times looking for sure. street parking. So there is a cap of what we can do annually, uh, and it's multiple times a year. But it, it would be based uh, moving forward it would be based on that occupancy data that we'd be getting with our LPR technology. Thanks. So any type yeah. of increase would be based on that, trying to get to that 85 percent. But even our cap, our highest that they could go, it's still, it's still going to be way, way below, below off yeah. street. Yeah. But so uh, do we? Um, do we get a cut, a cut of those private lots of what they charge, or when there's a, a fine, uh, yeah. a parking ticket issue, do we get a portion of that? We do not. Those are can, the, those. can we? Um, no, I would say that uh, right now we're working with the Downtown Spokane Partnership uh, with the Park Spokane Program. <clears throat> um, again, trying to just uh, enhance our relationship between the two parties. But they are independent operators. They own the yeah. land, uh, and so they they make their own. Do we, do we have to allow them to issue those tickets? Is that a state uh, requirement, or is that something in our local code? Uh, it's not in the, nothing in our local uh, uh, code that they're enforcing, so, uh, so that's a good question. I, I believe that it's all uh, private industry, and they're, uh, they're operating at their, their own. Is there, and then just last question on this, I know we're out of time. Uh, is there an agency that, that kind of watches their practices uh, for you know, unscrupulous, unethical type stuff. I mean, there's weights and measures for you know gas yeah. stations. Is there something like that? For uh, I, would, I, would, I don't think there's any regulatory oversight on private uh, parking lots, not, not to my knowledge. No. Might so, be time to start looking at that. <laughs> there you go. All right. Hey, really appreciate the great, engaging, and detailed and prepared conversation. Thank you both Thank you for guys. coming. Uh, all right. Kevin and team, you can go a little past 1230. No, we've got a 1230. I don't, he, he'll have to wait. It's his people that are driving. <laughs> no, it's everything else. There are no. questions. Maybe next time, don't give up your first spot. No. You're, you're, yeah. You were top of the meeting originally. Yeah, that's what we get for being there. That was a mistake. <laughs> that that was a way. mistake. <laughs> OK. Good afternoon. Uh, today we're talking about the 2021-2022 comprehensive plan amendments. We'll try not to go too past, no, past 12.30, but we'll do what we can. So first, just a brief review of the annual amendment process. The annual comprehensive plan amendment cycle takes about 14 months. These applications were submitted last October. We've been processing, getting comments. Plan Commission did hold their hearing a few weeks ago on September 14th and they extended it to the 28th and they made the recommendations. So we are now within the city council phase of the process. We're hoping to bring the amendments before you sometime in mid-November for a hearing and final decision. We received seven applications this year, five of which are private, two are city sponsored. The map shows the general location of the private applications. Um, and the first one we're gonna start with is Z21-280 comp. So I will hand that over to Kevin. I was going to say good morning. I think it's actually it's technically good afternoon now. But uh, thanks for having us. We will go pretty quickly. But if you guys have questions, feel free to stop us along the way. Um, so the first one is uh, application 280. This one's on West Cora, uh, right near Post, Post Street. I can talk, I swear. Um, so Faith Bible Church has two uh, fairly large parcels here. You can see that they are mostly vacant. Their church property does exist there, but uh, they have quite a bit of vacant land. And uh, this proposal also includes tiny pieces of the parcels to the west and the east. So while you see those apartment buildings to the west and the east as part of the application, it's really just a small portion of their land, more as a, as a cleanup. Uh, we're looking at about 19 acres. Again, it's two complete parcels and then two partials. Um, also, uh, where you see West Glass Avenue here on the north end, that's the top of a pretty substantial bluff. Uh, it averages about 80 feet along its length, although it, it's more or less um, at different points along the way. So the, the current land use plan map designation for this property is residential four to 10 units per acre. The, uh, the applicant would like to bring that up to residential 15 to 30. You'll recall that's, that's our middle of the road, uh, medium density residential. Uh, multifamily is, is generally there. Um, and then you can also see on the insets these little pieces of the properties to the east and west that would be corrected and match up with what's already there. The zoning they've requested, it's going from residential single family, it would now be residential multifamily. 
Um, the original applicant, the church, requested re a maximum height of 75 feet, which is why you see re uh, residential multifamily 75 on their property. But the two parcels, the one to the west, the one to the east, we would, uh, we would seek to match what's there now, which is just RMF. The default height there is 35 feet. Yes, sir. So can you just fill us in? I, I wasn't able to watch, or I haven't yet watched the discussion at the Planning Commission on this, but to me, with the bluff right there, this is an, an obvious place to have a, a much increased height limit. And so what was the, why, why did they decide to go so much lower than what was requested by the, the landowner? Uh, their discussion around the height was their concerns with the property owners to the north. We did receive quite a few comments uh, from property owners along Glass. Uh, there are a few properties there on the south side of Glass that are right on the bluff, right above this property. Um, and the, the heights in that location aren't quite 80 feet. They're actually a little lower because there's a step down after Glass Avenue. Um, and Plan Commission's feelings were that 75 was probably too much to ask in this location. So they, they chose the next step down on the code, which is 55 feet. And, and the, the property owner's response, do we know? The, the, the height discussion has been ongoing, but um, in, uh, in discussions during workshop and then f subsequent, the applicants indicated that 55 will work, but they would prefer to have taller, skinnier buildings in, rather than wider, f squatter buildings uh, to preserve more space between them. But ultimately, they haven't designed their ultimate solution here, so that it just changes how they design it. Okay. And I will, I'll, I'll say, just because it's my district, we had quite a quite a lot of comments and quite a few um, residents that were concerned about that. Yeah. But just to be clear, we make that final decision here? Yes, absolutely. And that decision is up to you at the hearing it stage. It sounds like there's a middle ground too, the 55, what's that? Yeah, the, the municipal code provides certain choices. It's not just a, any number that, yeah. that a property owner yeah. wants. Yeah. 75 is actually not one of those choices, okay. um, but 70 is. And okay. so uh, what will come before you is their original application, which is 75. Obviously, that's got to change something. Right. Uh, plan Commission's recommendation was for 55. There's also 150 feet, okay. <laughs> and uh, I believe uh, 35 and 40. So those are the options, and we'll make sure that that's on the slide. Okay. So Plan Commission was 50? Did you say 50? Plan Commission's recommendation was for you to choose 55 feet. Ultimately, oh, the decision is yours. No, I, 35 yeah. is the default for residential multifamily. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, we, if, you don't do, if you don't designate anything, it would be 35 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could, so 55 is the Plan Commission recommendation. Could you allow 55 but, but make a caveat that you could do 70 if it goes through some sort of design review? There's nothing in the code that would set that up. About okay. the only way to, to really do that would be probably through a, a development agreement, okay. which would severely delay yeah. things, at least a year to, to solve that. And yes, then sir. splitting the baby, could you do 55 and, could, could you do a mix of heights? Absolutely, you could, okay. you could say that a certain portion of the West, we allow split zone parcels. Okay. And that's essentially what it would be, is you would split zone, say, one part of it at 55 and one part of it you'd allow 70. So the, okay. the half that was right. the lower half could have a lower. Yeah, or higher. Yeah, or higher, well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, how many uh, stories is 55? Typically. 55 is um, generally five stories. It depends on what their base story is. The, uh, the intent with 55 was to give enough room for a taller, you know, maybe a 15 foot first floor and then 10 foot floor okay. subsequent. Right. But it's generally five so stories. So it's pretty, it's a lot of units. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And the, the number of units wouldn't change that they could do in the space because that, that number of units is based on the land use plan map designation, mm -hmm. which will still be 15 to 30 units per acre. The chief distance, difference you get when you're talking about that height max is whether you get tall, skinny buildings or wide, short buildings, mm -hmm. depending on whether they go for the maximum number of units or not. Right. There's so many variables when it comes to the development. That's why that's, it's frustrating for the public. It's frustrating for us to say what's coming, because we don't know until they're, they but propose. If, if their plans were around 70 or 75, I guess, um, theoretically, they may have to cut down the number of units unless they want to change the dimensions of the units that they're yeah. designing, right? Yeah, if they, wanted, if they wanted to retain some building footprint that they've already figured out and the height is lower, it would lower the number of units. Yeah. But again, they, they have not indicated that they have a design, okay. so it's hard to say. 
They, they, could, they could accommodate it a, a number of ways. Fewer units or bigger building footprint. Okay. Okay. So um, again, Plan Commission has held hearings on these and their recommendation for this was for approval, but they did recommend a height of 55 feet. So the, the two church parcels would be RMF 55 instead of RMF something else. So, and again, you do have that choice at the hearing if you want to pick something else. Um, ultimately, the, the ordinance that we'll bring to you will be based on the, the plan commission's recommendation. So, but you always have that chance at the hearing stage to change that. So. Did the planning commission hear um, the ability to split the 55 and the 75? It Did was not. That it idea? was not brought up by anybody. So um, they didn't discuss it. They didn't propose it. So. The nice thing is, is they did discuss a range of heights. They did discuss uh, how it might change height-wise. So if you were to make that change, technically, under the code, if you make a change that's substantive, it remands back to Plan Commission. In this case, I think that's a minor change. They did talk about the difference between 55 and 70. So it shouldn't require a remand if you, uh, if you guys wanted to change that. Okay. okay, so the next one, this is 281. This is on Freya. Uh, Pre-construction, as you can see from the aerial photo, it looks a little different now. But uh, the, the only parcel of this that was the original applicant is that one on the east side, the one that's actually on Freya Street. And it currently contains nothing. It's a, it's a gravel lot that folks are using for parking, um, but not the applicant. <laughs> so uh, all, at the docketing stage, the docketing committee recommended and, and ultimately um, city council affirmed the inclusion of these eight parcels to the west on Farrell Street. Um, so the current proposal is for a total of 1.6 acres. We're looking at nine parcels. Um, the change would be from residential 10 to 20 units per acre, which is a duplex level of density. Um, it would then update to general commercial, which would match what's, to the, what's basically surrounding these parcels. Um, that general commercial land use is uh, kind of centered around the, uh, the Fred Meyer just to kind of give you an idea, and just north of this is the freeway. So the zoning, uh, the zoning in that area is currently residential two-family. It would go to community business, 55-foot height limit. In other words, it would match that same zoning to the north and the west. Uh, Plan Commission heard this on the same dates, and their recommendation was for approval of all nine properties. Yes. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that could accommodate mixed use, right? Yeah, absolutely. Our, so, our community yeah. business... We allow residential in every zone except yeah. industrial, industrial, and even then some of the light industrial is allowed. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it would allow mixed use. It uh, certainly allows the homes there to remain, but if those homes and the eight additional properties decided that they wanted to redevelop or sell, they could. Um, in fact, the property, property on the southeast corner of Fifth and Farrell is a business. <laughs> it was uh, permitted before. It, it, it's the entire house. It's a house, but it's also a business. So in this case, that would become a, uh, you know, a, a absolutely allowed use. And for the next couple, I'll happily hand it off to Casey. Okay, so the next file is Z21282 <coughs> comp. That's located along East 31st Avenue. The original um, applicant's proposal is for the property on the left. That's the vacant property with trees. Um, there's no development on the property. There is a bit of a grade change. Um, East 30th on the map is currently under construction for a street. Um, this property is addressed on 31st, so 31st theoretically will be extending instead of 30th. During the docking process, the um, property across from Southeast Boulevard was added. That's the South Hill Park and Ride owned by STA. STA did provide comments um, supporting the you know, inclusion of their property in the proposal. So overall, we're looking at a potential change of 3.8 acres. Both properties currently have the land use plan map designation of residential four to 10 dwelling units an acre. And the proposal is to extend the nearby residential 15 to 30 dwelling units an acre. The existing zoning of both properties is RSF for residential single family. And the submitted proposal is to extend the RMF or residential multifamily. So plan commission did um, recommend approval. However, they did make some changes to the um, recommended land use and zone. So the two properties are near the Lincoln Heights District Center. So they are recommending extending kind of the center and quarter zoning. Um, so they're recommending CC transition for the land use and CC4 or the mixed use transition for the zoning. 
um, that does change some of the requirements such as, or allowances such as height and um, setbacks. Um, so the recommendation again is, is to change to that CC transition. Yes. So neighborhood has talked about a walking trail or some sort of, so we're, can you go back to the slide that shows 31st? So there, that south red line I think would be where they want their, the use now is a trail. That's how it's used. And they wanted some kind of accommodation for that. Was that discussed at all? Yes, so there has been discussion about a trail. So there is an unofficial trail that residents have just been using on the applicant's property. There's no easement, there's no allowances for it to remain. Um, however, there is right of way, as you can see along East 33rd Avenue, that's public right of way. Um, there has been comments from um, streets and, and various internal departments that we want to maintain that right of way. Um, and it would have sidewalks or some other you know, infrastructure for pedestrians. At the very least, even before any development would occur, that right of way exists. People could okay. theoretically walk on and turn into a trail. Good, thank you. What was the, what was the original request of the applicant in terms of the, the zoning? Uh, so it is, it is the residential 15 to 30 and then the residential multifamily, the applicant has submitted a letter in support of the CC transition and CC4 zoning. So they're, they're, they're okay with it? Okay. Yes. So if we're good, the next application is file Z21283 comp located along East 27th Avenue. The applicant's property is on the far end over here. During the docking process, four more properties were included. All of the properties include duplexes currently, and the area of change would be about 0.95 acres. The existing land use plan map designation is residential 10 to 20 dwelling units an acre, and the proposal is to extend the nearby residential 15 to 30 dwelling units an acre. The existing zone is RTF or residential two family, and the proposal is again to extend the nearby RMF residential multifamily zoning and at the hearing, Plan Commission did recommend approval um, of the proposal as submitted. Z21283 Comp is located along West Francis Avenue. The applicant's property, 284, yes, 284, please correct the typo, uh, is the, I call it the property with the tail, just to distinguish it. It is this um, odd shape. It was created through a boundary line adjustment that was approved last year. This aerial is not updated. Uh, the properties or the structures shown on this property were demolished. There is an office building that, um, it's, if it's not quite done yet, it's almost done. So there's an office building, parking lot, and associated landscaping. So just of note, those structures aren't there. During the docketing process, three additional properties were included. Two of them are parking lots, and then the one directly abutting the applicant's property is an existing single-family residence. Overall, the area change would be about 1.65 acres. So the, when we're talking about split land use and split zones, potentially, uh, these properties do have split land use. Um, for the current land use plan map designations, on these three properties, what we're looking at are the sections that have the residential four to 10 dwelling units an acre. And then this property is currently residential four to 10. The proposal is to extend the nearby or existing on these three properties office land use. So extending those to the full length of all of the properties. And for the zoning, again, what we're considering would be changing the existing RSF or residential single family zoning. Um, and it's just extending the adjacent zoning. So for the applicant's property, it, part of it is currently zoned OR, OR35, which is office retail with a 35 foot height limit. So that would be extending the OR35 to the full length of that property. So for the other two, so the other two split zoned, they have O35 office, 35, again, just extending that to the full length, and then the property along wall, extending the nearby O35. So making all of the full properties have some sort of office zoning. 
At the plan commission hearing, plan commission voted to um, recommend approval. However, they did recommend removal of one of the expansion properties. So at the hearing and during the hearing process, the property owners of the single family residence requested to be removed from the proposal. So plan commission in their recommendation removed that single family property from the proposal. And with that, we will look at Z22097 comp, which is one of the city sponsored amendments if Collins available. Good afternoon, council members. I'm here to talk about amendments to the bicycle master plan, which is an appendix to the comprehensive plan. So we have about a dozen amendments. Most of them are upgrades, upgrading bike friendly routes to neighborhood greenways, upgrading shared lanes to bike lanes, upgrading bike lanes to shared use paths. And this is mostly to keep pace with changing development patterns and changing demands as people are looking for more of these high quality facilities and, uh, and to keep up with best practices. Um, and so MAP TR5 is within chapter four, transportation and that's directly within the comp plan and then the rest of the bicycle master plan is an appendix. So the plan commission recommended approval. Um, staff, in our staff report, we recommended removing uh, Washington Avenue bike lanes through downtown. We had placed that in the recommendations because the downtown master plan update two years ago recommended um, protected bike lanes on Washington and Stevens as a couplet. Um, we proposed Washington first because it had the most capacity and room um, to use. And um, we requested that be withdrawn because we felt like we needed additional time to look at the intersections and the traffic volumes to make sure it would all work. Um, but the application as submitted includes Washington. So if you were to not include Washington, you'd have to specifically recommend that change. Otherwise, Washington would be included. And with that, uh, that's, that's all I have. Uh, any questions I can answer? All right, thank you. I, I have a question on this. So with the Planning Commission's recommendation, I understand that if we didn't approve what's happening on Washington, then we would have two separate things that were not in compliance. Is that correct? More or less, yeah. Do you want me to speak to that? Sure. Go with more. Um, so uh, just to clarify, um, the, the comments about removing Washington was uh, some internal discussion from various departments and that was a request that uh, the planning department basically honored to advance forward but after discussion at plan commission plan commission felt very strongly that that needed to be kept in the amendments uh, and part of that is because that downtown plan has been adopted as part of the comprehensive plan essentially and so we want plan commission felt it was important to have the map tr5 the bike map be consistent with what our comprehensive plan is saying elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So including Washington in the bike map would ensure that consistency. So that's, that's ultimately why plan commission went the way they did. And so what does the BAB say? Um, the, the bicycle advisory board was in support of all the um, proposals as originally written, including Washington, and they were in support of the bike lanes as proposed in the downtown master plan. Perfect, thank you. Um, next up is Inga Note with the arterial map amendments. Good afternoon. So we have um, <clears throat> both map amendments and a text amendment that we're bringing forward. Um, I think we've, that's all, have that's all we have. Show. Okay. Um, it, it's a bunch of different changes. Some of them are, um, yes, you do have them. Right. Okay. I, I'm not going to go through all of them though, in the interest of time. Um, some of them are just updating classifications. Some of them are, are new roadways. Um, a couple of them are STA requests, and those are the ones that really generated the most interest. Um, STA would like us to upgrade Pacific Avenue in Brown's Edition from a local to a, a minor collector, which would uh, allow us to put stop signs on the route 
and replace the yield signs. We did meet with the neighborhood. They were in support of that. They don't like the yield signs. Um, the other one STA asked for was um, a change on part of Cincinnati where the central city line is going to run and that really impacts only one intersection where we're going to put a stop sign so there hasn't been any controversy over that one. But we did have quite a bit of feedback on their request for G Street between Rowan and Francis and um, at the Planning Commission discussion um, STA said, you know, it's not critical to their operations. They requested it because they had other requests. It would be easier for their operators if they could put stop signs on this local street and make it a minor, or make it a minor collector. But um, there is a lot of concern for the neighborhood that will increase speeds, which is often a side effect if you put stop signs on the side streets. And so um, I think in the end, Planning Commission said to take it off? Yes. Yes, okay. But other than that, everything else that was in the, the recommendation stayed the same. So, yeah. the, the Cincinnati, is, does that in any way impede the, the Greenway? The, no. What's being proposed? Okay. No, actually it'll make it better because okay. then the cyclists won't have conflicting traffic to contend with. Okay. And on G Street, there's, a, there's an elementary school there on G Street, correct? To the west? Yeah, it, it's not, Lynn the bus Wood route doesn't or... front it. From what I recall, it's about a block away. Okay. The kids do cross at one of the crossings. Okay. General. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, just as a as a next step, I mean, obviously, all the information is on the website, including our staff reports. If you want to deep dive, and then we'll attach those to the on base items ultimately. Um, we don't have ordinances ready for you to review yet, so what we will do is I'm hoping to have them as a consent item on pies, if that's acceptable, um, and that way you'll be able to review those. They will. There's one ordinance for each application, just for clarity of the decision, um, and then we will draft those according to Plan Commission's recommendation. So if you, again, if you want to change those, that's totally possible during the process, but that's, that's how you'll see them written. Try to make it as easy as possible for you. Yes. Have you coordinated with Jacoby to put it on pies? I will be. Okay. I, I believe it's due Wednesday. So I have to, I'm waiting for to get those drafted and get those through legal okay. review and then they will be ready to go. So, and so. also Kevin, I just want, I really want to thank you. We've been doing this for a number of years and you make it fun and easy. <laughs> so thank you for that. Cause this well, could be very complicated and painful. Thank you. And you have made it not so. Thank we you. did take off the rubber noses, but you know, yeah, we, exactly. next time party hats, party hats would be good. Party hats would be great. So, well, we appreciate it. And I know that we're about to send you about 700 pages of things to read. So my apologies, but, um, hopefully that answers most of your questions, but we're always around and happy to answer questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for us. All right. Well, you did a fabulous job, which only means that Lori and I can be on time to our next meeting. So. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.